as the invasion was by this point well underway across the entire nation, and just a specific sector of the invasion itself, as Trojan shock armies were busy breaking out of their CCP regime-owned properties and going straight for their objectives throughout the land, along the borders, the external forces crossed in all major invasion prongs, moving east to west within just this specific sector. At the Battle of McAllen slash Lower Rio Grande River, progress had been steadily underway as the 16th Group Army had by this point moved steadily inland within hours, clearing a large area for the movement of five other Group Armies following them within this invasion prong a grand total of which constituted some roughly 320,000 troops with their full complement of artillery, armor, and additional equipment. Under the generous cover of their own artillery, coming from the 19th Artillery Division within just the 16th Group Army alone, as well as the 1 Divisional Artillery Battalion of the 46th Mechanized Division, in addition to the 19th Artillery Division here, as well as the 4th Armored Division's very own Artillery Battalion as well, offering its support to the combat forces of the 4th. By hour number 5, large swathes of the areas across the border had by this point been cleared on the western flank by the 5th Anti-Tank Brigade and the 16th Group Army's Special Operations Battalion, which had eliminated many groupings of armed civilian pockets as well as the 136th MP Brigade belonging to the 36th Maneuver Enhancement Brigade steadily moving along the Rio before heading north in several different prongs, axes of advance, all under the generous cover of artillery fire as well as a dedicated SU-25 squadron of 12 dedicated ground attack aircraft constituting this squadron being this SU-25 ground attack aircraft squadron which by now was flying its third sortie in the opening hours of the invasion going up the center was of course the 46th Mechanized Infantry Division with its own one battalion of divisional artillery supporting its movement as well as the 4th Armored Division and its own one artillery battalion supporting its movements. As route clearance and area clearance in general in this specific battle space was of the utmost importance and was thus needing to be carried out by the 16th Group Army spearheading their prong of invasion of their six different group armies, including themselves, within just this one prong. As it was entirely possible that despite having lost all their communications all their information technology and ISR assets that the Americans could conceivably put together small bands of guerrilla-like forces and hit weaker vehicles in the convoys, thus creating massive bottlenecks and causing a hindrance to the speed of advance while headed deep inland into the country. And this was completely unacceptable 
for the invaders. Thus, it was the utmost importance that all routes of advance be completely cleared of any and all resistance, as even determined armed civilians with simple weapon systems like Molotov cocktails potentially could indeed cause havoc on lightly skinned vehicles such as trucks or other simple headquarters or supply type vehicles and thereby cause enormous traffic jams. Route 281 especially was highly important in this effort. As the urban center of McAllen and all of its surrounding cities had been extremely badly raked with artillery fire and shells of all sizes, 155, 152, and 122 millimeter rockets, in addition to the 300 millimeter rockets hitting further out targets due to their having longer range and very generous potent firepower to them, these forces went up and cleared the city of what remained of its original defenders before moving on to Edinburgh by about hour five, detaching two battalions to go and clear it of armed civilian resistance. As the anti-tank forces cleared their flanks, Upon eliminating a band of armed civilians within the city of Mission, three anti-tank battalions headed straight north, eliminating another and destroying the rest of the 4th of the 133rd, the 4th Battalion of the 133rd Field Artillery Regiment, a High Mars, or a High Mars battalion, that had gotten off its first volley before having two of its three firing batteries being completely destroyed by air and 300 millimeter strikes before the last firing battery and its headquarters battery had tried to escape to set up to fire one last volley before they had been intercepted by these anti-tank battalions as well as being pinpointed by ISR assets such as an orbiting WZ-7 recon drone with a wide-reaching view of the entire battle space as well as smaller quadcopter drones manned by individual squads or platoons as well as satellite footage in real time making it able to pinpoint their exact location for follow-up artillery strikes from 300 millimeter rockets as well as them being surrounded and annihilated by these anti-tank battalions. In the opening stages, the HHC and Signals Company of the 625th Brigade, which was now attached to the 136th Maneuver Brigade, had most of their vehicles destroyed, and what few hadn't been destroyed by the airstrikes were abandoned, with the troops trying to proceed on foot only themselves to then be intercepted by the vehicles of these three different battalions moving and hooking to the north upon having finished off the 4th of the 133rd. In the east, the armor was making good progress as the 4th Armored Division had cleared all civilian resistance pockets, including even paramilitary forces, as well as also, in addition, a small military garrison that had been using the Padre Island International Airport as a makeshift ad hoc ISR slash logistical base for local forces in the region, conducting previously assigned border operations due to previously failed border policy, as well as a show of force, in quotes, as tensions heated up. 
Sino-Russian naval drills, predominantly having been a contributing factor to these tensions off of both coasts of the country, although they weren't quite aware that a massive invasion force had been preparing to strike out from within and from without their nation. As all these culminating factors came together, vicious battles broke out throughout the land and the unsuspecting defenders were caught completely off guard. There was another international airport in the city of McAllen, although this particular airport was taken without a fight and would be used as a forward operating base for the four follow-up battalions of national militia forces that would be accompanied by a battalion moving in the area later of National Construction Corps forces, which were a paramilitary civil and combat engineering force as they were armed and militarily trained, and they would construct forward operating bases in the area to guard one of the many gateways into the country for supplies that would now be coming from Mexico upon the end of the invasion to replenish supplies that had been used up on the CCP properties by the end of the fourth day of the entire invasion. As enormous billions of tons of materiel would indeed have all been nearly used up by invasion's end. As the armor advanced, surrounding and destroying armed civilian pockets, scenes like these were commonplace. With armored companies peeling off of their battalions to surround and destroy entire areas of resistance, oftentimes with air cover coming from their Russian counterparts of the VVS or the Russian Air Force, such as this Su-25 depicted having peeled off of the squadron to hit ground targets with KH-23 laser-guided air-to-ground missiles, also capable of dropping various types of ordnances as well, or firing their two 30 millimeter cannons. Armed civilians often tried to flee the area upon the impacts of tank shells, such as the tank shells that blasted two fleeing pickup trucks into scattered wreckage and smoking hulks of metal. The armed civilians could do very little but turn and fire at their attackers, doing nothing and possibly not even scratching the paint on the enemy vehicles, if that. Wooded areas oftentimes did provide a measure of cover from enemy surveillance systems as coniferous type trees and even other types of foliage as well did provide a measure of obscurity to infrared imaging as well as other forms of imaging including night vision making it exceedingly difficult to always see where individual personnel could be hiding within these forested areas as the canopies did offer them enough cover to where if they stayed still or relatively well concealed, they could sometimes wait out an enemy attack and sit and wait for them to pass through an area before emerging to attempt to forage for supplies at some of the few buildings that were still intact and not as of yet destroyed 
as no resistance had been spotted coming from said buildings. There were indeed many civilians that had been left unharmed as well, as any unarmed civilians were, at least for the meantime, ignored and bypassed as they didn't constitute any immediate threat. Although such was not always the case, as some of the more brutal paramilitary elements made it a point to slaughter civilian populations. Vehicles attempting to run the gauntlet of the air and ground fire didn't always make it, as such being the case here, where two were destroyed by a tank shell, fleeing with this band of armed civilians. This one to be destroyed soon after, as it was extremely simple for modern battle tanks to hit moving targets, even as they themselves were on the move, as their gun stabilizing systems and fire control systems made this fairly simple. Not only that, but loitering munitions posed a constant threat from the air as well, apart from just the combat aircraft that scoured the area for targets. Blasting munitions such as these tank shells ravaged homes and properties, such as where a farmer's fuel storage site was hit, which set the barn on fire, as well as blasting it into oblivion. As it pertained to the last portion of the battle at McAllen, there was a moderately sized armed civilian element, a militia force that had been put together as a result of previous failed border policies, feeling the need among the locals to band together into some sort of an ad hoc security force. Thus, Oftentimes in border areas, armed civilians came together and formed their own ad hoc-like militia forces, such as here. As in the first hour of the invasion, their first compound had been completely destroyed as per ascertained intelligence and Surveillance on their area had determined that this fortified compound, a farm with berms and concertina wire fencing, was some sort of an armed militia compound. The Chai Coms levied heavy rocket strikes upon it, although there were two additional other compounds, each roughly about seven miles away. Now, these were not fortified compounds and were not commonly frequently used by said forces. Although, while these compounds were still within earshot of the enormous blasts of the 300 millimeter rockets, those in the area couldn't have known exactly, per se, what had been occurring. Although it could be said that as soon as these personnel emerged in strength and were identified by the ISR assets from drones to satellite to aircraft, 
they would be identified and they would be engaged next. By 5.15 a.m. or 5.25 hours or five and a quarter hours into the invasion, the PHL-03 Battalion, one of the last battalions of the 19th Artillery Division to pack up and cross the border behind the Howitzer and 122mm rocket battalions, received its last few fire missions to be fired while still set up in Mexico, south of Reynosa, Mexico. In addition, another two pairs, or essentially four total, of the 12 SU-25s in the area were likewise assigned to strike missions against these very militia forces, hitting several different sites, basically farms where enemy activity was spotted in the area with their KH-23 shorter range air-to-ground beam-riding missiles, or laser-guided missiles, essentially, which were line of sight and upon being fired, would, fo would follow their laser to their path, hitting it within a seven-mile range, seven miles being its longest range, but certainly could hit within shorter ranges as well. And 30-millimeter blasting ammunition loaded into their nose cannons for strafing, and as well as dropping a few 1,000-pound munitions per aircraft as it pertained to the attacks levied from the air upon these American personnel, as mentioned earlier. As the 300 millimeter rockets smashed the two remaining compounds upon their discovery, and really a large surrounding area adjacent to each, of a total of one kilometer by 1.2 miles, roughly, the now dispersed remaining Americans losing most of their logistical stashes within said strikes were now engaged by both the Special Operations Battalion's companies that comprise the battalion as well as those of two different anti-tank battalions belonging to the 5th Anti-Tank Brigade, of whom the latter's combat companies being equipped with five long-range and potent AFT-10 systems, which essentially were eight pods per system of HJ-10 missiles apiece, and 10 ZBD-04 infantry fighting vehicles. Essentially, one platoon was strictly AFT-10s, or anti-tank vehicles, and the other two were basically very heavy infantry forces that were built around operating anti-tank systems. They were anti-tank weapon focused, sort of like a heavy infantry reinforced by anti-tank vehicles, which comprise these battalions, as it were. As in, these companies that made these anti-tank battalions were heavy infantry coupled together with anti-tank vehicles. This, of course, in terms of the combat companies and their composition as each company consisted of two platoons of these heavy anti-tank-oriented infantry forces riding in ZBD-04s, and one platoon was strictly anti-tank vehicles, as mentioned. Chaos reigned supreme amid the Americans, who utterly lacked any effective communications beyond a very short range and the sheer violence and vicious rapid pace of the strikes and ground assault 
proved to be far beyond the scope of what these forces were actually capable of and what they could even realistically deal with. As it was already devastating enough upon the actual military forces in this sector, much less all the other defensive components even attempting to rise to the occasion. Like all the other engagements within the seven-hour-long total battle in just this region, this one lasted only a relatively short amount of time. From the 300 millimeter rocket artillery and airstrikes that initiated it until the ground forces arrival minutes later and their very mopping up of the area's defenders in conclusion. This battle lasted only until 6.05 a.m. or 50 minutes long in duration. Again, pressed for time, the forces continued on their way in order to wipe the very last final vestiges of resistance within this area off of the literal and proverbial map of the region. All as other elements of the 5th Anti-Tank Brigade caught up with and finished off what remained of the 130th Maneuver Enhancement Brigade's last two companies, its headquarters and headquarters company and attached signals company, who earlier fled at initiation of hostilities in an attempt at survival, as their vehicles had been struck from the air and they had lost many troops in just the initial air strikes. What is occurring on this map is an enormous area was blanketed by additional 300 millimeter rocket strikes. Some of the last fire missions done by these battalions that were actually fired from Mexican soil in order to give fire support to these anti-tank companies belonging to the anti-tank battalions that attack this area. As two different anti-tank battalions and the actual special operations battalion belonging to the 16th Group Army were they who attacked this area. Now, the special operations group was not on this map. It was off further to the west. This is only an excerpt of the larger battle as a whole. And in this particular area, this just shows the anti-tank forces and their engagement with the Americans while also receiving enormous rocket artillery strikes in support of their ground assault, as well as air support from a pair of SU-25s, while there's another pair of SU-25s, as there were four total committed to just this area, that are likewise off the map helping other anti-tank companies and the special operations companies that were a bit further to the west. Just in this one segment, there were hundreds of Americans engaging hundreds of anti-tank troops. Just on this segment of the battle, there's three anti-tank companies pictured. One right here, and its headquarters platoon, part of one right here, and part of one right here. And as many had been struck and destroyed, along with farms and other buildings that were hit by these rockets in this large area, because this is a three by two mile in sized map as a whole. 
There were also a few CH-901 loitering munitions that flew over to follow and destroy retreating armed civilian forces of this group. As you can see, the group on this side of the road in the woods was spotted emerging from the woods by these loitering munitions and was thereby destroyed, as this brown symbolizes the mesquite, scrub brush, and some hardwood tree woods here in this area. Again, the green arrow showing the direction they were moving is encapsulated with red, meaning they were hit and destroyed by the chai combs. This group did manage to flee the area, though. This is not encapsulated, and they managed to get away. Many were not so fortunate and were swallowed up by this enormous area that was totally saturated by rocket fire from 300 millimeter rockets. As mentioned, a 1.2 mile essentially from this end to this end by a one kilometer area was completely saturated by the very powerful 300 millimeter rocket strikes. Down here at this farm, you have some being wiped out by the blast radius and shrapnel, as well as being fired upon as these forces here move up and into position with some of the anti-tank forces sitting further back, leisurely able to fire their long-range HJ-10 anti-tank missiles at targets such as groupings of troops or buildings where they had quite devastating effect. House, house, barn, barn, silo. Many of these forces here were laying down in the prone position. Of course, you had a technical right here with a guy with a rifle in the back essentially firing, using it as a sort of technical as well as a few pickups here as well, technicals. These troops who hadn't, or these armed civilians that hadn't been eliminated as of yet were taking fire, which is what the red means. Means they were being engaged, but they hadn't quite yet have been wiped out until they tried to cross the road here, by which point these infantry fighting vehicles, they didn't use any armor personnel carriers in the anti-tank forces. They, these were all infantry fighting vehicles. These were very heavy anti-tank weapon focused type of infantry forces, essentially married together with a platoon of anti-tank vehicles, dedicated anti-tank vehicles. These IFVs also had anti-tank capabilities as they had HJ-08 pods on the sides of their turrets these ZBD-04s, of course. Although they were usually for defensive purposes, they could very well be used in offensive means, as in defensive against enemy armor, but they could likewise use them in an attack as well. As in, if they weren't being attacked by enemy, enemy armor, they could use them on any other type of target they so chose to do. These infantry squads dismounted from were equipped with light, heavier anti-tank systems, such as tripod or personally carried HJ-08 tubes, which they could mount on a tripod or fire from a, a kneeling or laying position, or they could be carrying Type 69 RPG-type weapons, which were mass-produced in the billions. There were so many stocks of these that it seemed like they had an endless amount. And they were liberally handed out to troops like these, among others. They moved up the hill 
and their wedge formations, along with the vehicles moving up with them so they can mutually support each other, the infantry supporting the armor and the armor acting as a mobile fire support platform for the dismounted infantry type forces, these anti-tank dedicated heavy infantry forces of the anti-tank battalions and the companies that comprise the whole battalion, such as these forces. Moving up through this area in the bend of the line of advance, you have these vehicles behind a, a rolling hill here where the elevation changes, where it you have a hill here, slight valley here, another hill, higher part of the hill, another higher part of the hill. You have woods here. You have these armed militia type forces trying to get to the high ground so that they could get a better view of what's going on as they lacked any sort of communications and they needed to be able to surveil the battlefield in some manner. So they attempted to get up on the high ground only to be fired upon by 100 millimeter cannons of the infantry fighting vehicles, 30 millimeter auto cannons with blasting ammunition, or the dismounted infantry forces themselves firing small arms at them or light anti-tank weapons, sometimes heavier ones like their HJ08s. SU-25s coming down and strafing, having fired their KH-23s from back here, as you can see where the smoke trails begin back here. Coming down on their attack run, firing them, leveling out, firing some 30 millimeter rounds before quickly pulling up. Now, when these SU-25s were doing attack runs, they stayed at a certain altitude to avoid any type of friendly fire, and they stayed within a designated flight path as directed by their joint air traffic controllers who helped to navigate these aircraft safely through a battlefield where there were steady munitions being exchanged and movements of troops on the ground in order to avoid friendly fire so that they constantly knew where their allies were. These Russian VVS pilots knew where their allies, the Chicoms, were and knew where the enemies were as far as where they were going to attack specifically, such as these areas here, this farm and this farmhouse and silo being strafed and being hit by these air-to-ground missiles alongside of the Chicom anti-tank missiles, 100 millimeter IFV cannon fire, 30 millimeter auto cannon fire, and small arms fire. All creating yet another kill box of sorts as the rocket artillery came smashing and crashing down to the ground, wiping out a huge area just in this part of the battle. There's more going on in other parts of this specific engagement, as this is only a small excerpt of the larger battle going on between these armed civilian militia-type forces and the Chicoms and their Russian air support in this just this one area. Right here you have two trucks trying to come down this road only to be hit by a, an HJ-08 anti-tank missile blasting this one immediately. Some of the blast radius and shrapnel engaging the back of this one and as it went around and turned on this road it was completely annihilated by this infantry fighting vehicle. 
taking direct hits to the front of it and blasting it into pieces as 30 millimeter auto cannon fire ripped ripped it into a bunch of shreds of metal that now littered the road in this particular sector you have troops dismounting the back of this infantry fighting vehicle and over here, these men here had already since been dismounted and they formed up into a wedge formation. These men at this moment are in a line, in a single line formation. And they're moving up this slightly rolling hill here, along with their infantry fighting vehicles, three of which are moving up onto the hill to support them. With the small arrow coming off of this one, meaning that it's dismounting its squad up here on this hill. That's what this little arrow means. As these other two are already dismounted, whenever you see a line here and a smaller arrow coming out of it, that's where that squad is actually being dismounted as it's still inside the vehicle until it gets to that point. This squad continues to bound, stop, cover, stop, take cover, bound, take cover, bound, and take cover. Getting all the way to the road as they are engaging each other from hill to hill, these forces here firing at the forces on this larger hill right here and all of these forces taking position on the hill, these American personnel, these militia-type forces, returning fire across the road at the other hill where the Chai Com infantry fighting vehicles and infantry dismounts are now taking position, trying to close the distance in order to get to the optimum firing distance for accuracy purposes as it relates not to the vehicle so much, but to the dismounts, as the vehicles are simply there to act as a mobile fire support platform. And as you can see, the vehicles have some of the most devastating effect, as they're almost entirely responsible for all these casualties. As the 100mm cannons, 30mm auto cannons, and HJ-08 anti-tank missiles used here and there have caused tremendous destruction on the forces on this hill. Over here by the gas station, you have forces following these roads here, trying to go around this gas station and this country store right off of the gas station, approaching this road only to be attacked from the forces on this hill and here, interlocking their fire. Now, you have to understand, being that this is such a large area, a four by two mile map, the distance, by the time the squad reaches the road here, the distance between the forces on this hill and this road is about 550 meters. So there's still quite a distance, but they generally try to close that gap so that the infantry dismounts can fire with much better accuracy. Here the combat was a bit closer and roughly 200 meters. And you have more going on up here. As again, this is just a small excerpt of a larger battle as there's more rocket artillery hitting off the map here, hitting behind further up here to the west. This is just one corner of the battle. As the wedge formations bound and cover, they essentially move in a leapfrogging action. But in this case, as their vehicles move up with them, they steadily roll beside them to provide them a shield in some cases, 
from some directions of fire, as well as a mobile gun platform. The highest part of this hill here are being held by these two infantry squads levying all their fire down on these forces here at these two different farms along with their support from the air air strikes and again you had the loitering munitions back here armed with fragmentation warheads fired by the headquarters battalion of the 5th anti-tank brigade due to the fact that no vehicles were lost by the chai -coms, their headquarters assets weren't needed to be used in this particular area because their Type 84 recovery vehicles stayed within the protective star formation of MRAPs, your VP-11 or Tiger MRAPs. And of course, the fuel truck wasn't going to be used in the middle of a battle. As the fuel trucks of each headquarters platoon and headquarters company of battalions had their fuel trucks as well, were there to provide logistical support to the combat vehicles after battles were won, as the vehicles could line up alongside the fueler, go through and fill up their tanks. And the fuel trucks would get more fuel from CCP properties as they moved further inland, because there were specifically CCP properties stocked full of logistics for at least as long as the entire invasion's duration, and sometimes there were still supplies left over even after the initial four-day invasion ended. But after the invasion, more, more supplies would have to be brought in to restock all of the new CHICOM bases, as well as their old bases that were the CCP properties used as supply bases. Thus, they would have to come up from getting to ports in Mexico, they would need to be trucked into the country to all the CHICOM supply bases and allied supply bases and newer forward operating bases, such as their airports that they captured and turned into FOBs, or in some cases, old American military bases. They could be flown in or trucked in, but the overland route would have been, would have been the most efficient as convoys of vehicles could bring in far more than could supply aircraft. But at least for the first invasion phase, which is what is being covered, the initial four-day invasion, the CCP properties operated by the Trojan shock armies were stocked with enormous, ample supplies for the invasion forces, including the externals who would stop every so often at these CCP properties in order to get more fuel, ammunition, medical supplies if needed, vehicle maintenance if needed, and more. As these civilian forces were swiftly dealt with. The seven hour long battle was coming to its end. With America's combat air fleet having basically been eviscerated within these opening hours of combat, within the scope and scale of this mammoth invasion, there was no hope of any air cover whatsoever at all for the battered ground-based defenders, which likewise led to follow-up sorties 
of coalition fighter aircraft, which normally were used in an air-to-air -air role for air superiority, increasingly returning to the battlefield from their bases, now laden with air-to-ground munitions, adding even more of a punishing weight on top of the already gargantuan fleet of dedicated ground attack aircraft and the even far heavier strategic aircraft, whose sole purpose themselves was to level and raise entire massive areas to the ground. In the dark, no communications or intelligence, being hit from all sides by air, sea, and land, the defenders were quickly and easily swept aside. Artillery and missile strikes were ubiquitous and non-withstandable. And added to these were the FPV and loitering munition drones, which added an incredibly lethal new dynamic to the overall combat itself, causing great fear and angst amongst the ranks of the defenders, as these particular weapons appeared quietly above and seemingly out of nowhere. Even while this battle was occurring and quickly wrapping up almost as soon as it began, many installations of the defenders were all rapidly being crushed and overrun throughout the land, erupting into struggles to simply survive. In many cases, as most weren't even armed properly, were prepared when their duty stations were struck. And this didn't just pertain to forward operating bases of certain types of units or their pre-prepared firing positions and campsites, such as was the case of the 4th of the 133rd, this related to large formal installations like Fort Hood or Fort Bliss or Fort Sill and others, such as all the air bases in San Antonio and bases in DFW or in Houston. As personal weapons, as it related to the forces on these installations, weren't even signed out in many cases, along with whole units being within their barracks or even their off-base housing at the time of the invasion. As this battle in the lower Rio Grande slash McAllen area wrapped up, as all the other group armies were convoying behind the spearheading 16th group army, which by the end of the battle, their forces had now virtually cleared this entire massive nearly 100 by 120 mile area of all civilian and organized armed forces or paramilitary resistance. All of the subunits of the 16th Group Army began to form up as they were getting ready to pass Corpus Christi en route to the Houston area to get on their assigned invasion route of I-10 to proceed into the southeast of the soon-to-be-conquered America.
within the seventh and final hour. The last moves were conducted at the Fayesville area by the 46th Mechanized Infantry Battalion. Encountering a civilian ambush just outside of the town, their mechanized artillery forces lobbed artillery shells at the retreating guerrilla formation as they conducted a hit-and-run attack on one of the battalions, which peeled off to engage them as the ISR assets had actually seen them setting up this ambush. And as these forces fled, badly mauled by the attacking battalion, as their guerrilla strike went wrong, massive artillery fire from 155 howitzer shells rained down upon them. As for the 18th Air Defense Artillery Brigade, its battalions had since leapfrogged into the land. And with no air threat anymore within this area, all prepared to pack up and get into a convoy with all the rest of their own group army, with the five other group armies in the invasion prong following, as during the battle itself, as they kept a few battalions on station in Mexico, they moved a few inland, and then they kept those ready as the ones in Mexico moved ahead, and they did this until reaching Fayesville, as in their two HQ J battalions, their one HQ 11 battalion, their 1 HQ-6A battalion, and their two truck-based 57mm cannon battalions all leapfrogged up 281. The last artillery forces to fire from Mexico, as stated, were the two battalions of 300mm longer-range rocket artillery systems firing at the mass of armed civilian militia forces that had been simultaneously attacked from the air and land as well by the Special Operations Battalion of the 16th Group Army and two anti-tank battalions belonging to the 5th Anti-Tank Brigade. Now that this last fire mission had been completed, those two final battalions of artillery packed up and got into convoy formation behind the Air Defense and 46th Mechanized Infantry Division. The Group Army's Independent Headquarters Battalion, which encapsulated its entire command elements and commander, likewise got on 281 to follow the rest of their forces. The 4th Armored Division was preparing to join up with the rest to spearhead the convoy. Upon having completed their clearance of this area, they were to head slightly to the northwest to lead their convoy of the 16th Group Army, forging ahead into the Corpus Christi area, which was just off this map and slightly to the northeast, as they were to essentially go around the city. As there was a small Trojan force within the city of allied Central American units that were part of the entire invasion coalition forces. By hour seven, this battle had ended and the four national militia battalions moved in to take their positions in the McAllen International Airport and the almost completely gutted Padre Island International Airport, as their sole task would be route clearance, as in making sure that these routes were clear of any resistance for supplies to move through upon invasion's end, as this would be one of the many supply gateways 
into the nation from the south as it was occupied and conquered after the four-day invasion. Their other missions would be to patrol the battered, badly damaged, nearly raised to the ground urban areas of the McAllen Metroplex and Brownsville areas. National Construction Corps battalions, two of which would come through ultimately with one leading to turn these airports into suitable fobs for, for future operations. This concludes the Battle of McAllen slash Lower Rio Grande Valley. The next battle series in this entire documentary series will be the Battle of Laredo in the next video.